of these identifying marks as the United States of America does. But there's one more identifying mark that the Bible tells us about. I want you to open your Bibles back to Revelation chapter 13 there. Revelation chapter 13. And notice what the Bible says here. Because this power, we are told, speaks on behalf of somebody eventually. Revelation 13, verse 11. And I beheld another beast come up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a what? He spake as a dragon. Friends, eventually this power, which I believe is the United States of America, which was founded upon Christian principles of separation in church and state, which is looking for freedom, eventually comes to the position where it speaks as a dragon. Who is a dragon? We've learned in previous lectures that the dragon represents Satan, the enemy of God. Now notice, as it says there, it speaks. How does a nation speak? A nation speaks through its legislative powers. What are they going to speak? What are they going to legislate? Look at verse 12. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to do what? To worship the first beast. Friends, this power, the United States of America, is going to legislate worship. We've discovered what it's going to be about. It's going to be all about Sunday, isn't it? It's going to be all about pushing the world back to the papacy. Now, notice what the second beast power will do. In verse 12, we just read, it's going to force the world to worship or obey the papacy. We read there in verse 16 and 17, that this power will enforce the mark of the beast. In other words, it will create Sunday legislation. And it's going to enforce obedience through trade sanctions and a death penalty in verse 15, 16, and 17. Friends, this is what the Bible's telling us that the United States of America will do in the very near future. There must be some sort of muscle power behind pushing the world to accepting Sunday, and the Bible's telling us it will be the United States of America. The Bible is telling us that these two end-time world superpowers, in Revelation 13, it brings out two end-time world superpowers. The first one is the papacy, the second one is the United States of America, and the Bible is telling us they're going to come together and form an alliance to bring the world to a position to receive the mark of the beast. Church and state will unite to enforce religious practices. The USA will cause the world to worship the first beast and to receive the mark of the beast, which is Sunday. And for this to happen, you and I should be seeing an alliance be formed between the papacy and the United States of America. Do we see that taking place today? How does the USA relate to the papacy today? You see, in the past, the United States of America and the papacy have been poles apart. The foundation of both of these systems is opposite. But we are seeing in our world today that they have come into a close union in the last few years. In the past, they would have nothing to do with each other. But in the last few years, they've begun to come together. Even up until the 1960s, back in the 1960s, when John F. Kennedy was running for presidency in the United States of America, they had never had a Catholic president before. And many of the people were getting concerned, thinking, well, if we get a Catholic president, he really has to obey the Pope. What will happen to our Constitution that guarantees freedom? How will he relate to that? And I want to play a short piece of video here of a lady asking John F. Kennedy a question as he was running for presidency of how he would relate to the Constitution. I want you to listen to this short video for just a few moments. Religious issues that keep coming up to confuse the public. Well, I, uh, I uh, think that, uh, oh, I don't mind. I must say that uh, we shouldn't uh, move because it's a, uh, I am running for the uh, presidency, which is a powerful office, gives great power under the Constitution, and it is a matter of concern to a good many people, and the best way to get it answered, it seems to me, is to ask the question openly. And permit me to say that I support strongly the Constitution. I support strongly the separation of church and state. That is, does the candidate believe in the Constitution? Does he believe in the First Amendment? Does he believe in the separation of church and state? Now, when the candidate's given his views on that question, 
and I think I've given my views very fully. I think the subject's exhausted. Okay, did you notice those words there, friends? John F. Kennedy was asked the question, do you believe in the separation of church and state? Will you uphold the principle of the separation of church and state? And he basically said, I will uphold the principle of the separation of church and state. In other words, what he was saying is, I won't obey the Pope as my religious leader above the Constitution of the United States of America. This is back in the 1960s, friends. But has the United States of America changed since the 1960s? Let's have a look at this statement here from the Washington Post, April 16, 2001. Notice these words. In 1960, the Roman Catholic John Kennedy went from Washington down to Texas to assure Protestant preachers that he would not obey the Pope. In 2001, George Bush came from Texas to Washington to assure a group of Catholic bishops that he would. Friends, there's been a transformation in the 1960s. The Roman Catholic John F. Kennedy said, I will not obey the Pope. But here we find in 2001, George W. Bush coming from Texas to Washington to assure Catholic bishops that he would obey the Pope. Friends, there's been a change in the United States of America, hasn't there? Why is this taking place? Why? Because prophecy said it would happen. Prophecy is being fulfilled before our very eyes today. Notice this statement here from George W. Bush. Bush. The best way to honour Pope John Paul II Truly one of the great men is to take his teaching seriously, is to listen to his words and, to, and put his words and teachings into, a, into action here in America. This is a challenge we must accept. Friends, we are seeing today the relationship between the papacy and the USA changing. And we, we find a tremendous insight into this union in the demise of communism in the late 80s and the early 90s. In the famous article in the Time magazine of the, the Holy Alliance, we find in this edition of the Time magazine that Carl Bernstein reported on a secret meeting between the Pope and Reagan in the Vatican Library that combined the two most powerful forces in the world into an alliance which had world-changing results. Listen to what Bernstein had to say in this article. He said, In that meeting, Reagan and the Pope agreed to undertake a clandestine campaign to hasten the disillusion of the communist empire. This was one of the great secret alliances of all time. Here we find, friends, as Bible prophecy predicts, these two powers would come to the front at the end of time and work together. One enforcing the USA, enforcing the world to worship the beast. They're coming together. They've come together to bring down communism. The article goes on to say how these two powers would work together to influence Russia militarily, economically and morally. And through covert church actions in the Eastern Bloc countries, it would bring down the power of communism. It also claimed that the US altered some of their moral policies in order to fit the wishes of the papacy. But friends, we saw this take place in the late 80s and the early 90s. And this is showing us the power that these two nations have as they come together, these two powers, to bring down the power of communism. Well, what did Gorbachev say about the whole situation? Gorbachev said, Everything which took place in Eastern Europe in recent years would have been impossible without the Pope's effort and the enormous role, including the political role, which he played in the world arena. Friends, the Pope's political role in our world today is not just for the good of mankind, it is to fulfill Bible prophecy and bring the papacy back on top. It's to fully heal the deadly wound. And ever since 1929, when Mussolini signed that historic concordat with the papacy, the papacy has been growing back faster and faster, and their agenda, my friends, is world domination. It's an agenda to fully heal the deadly wound of 1798 and bring the papacy back on top. And we are seeing it fulfilled before our eyes today. The Bible said that this power would receive a deadly wound, his wound would be healed, and after that, all the world would wander and follow after the beast. Their plan, their goal, their desire is to come back on top of the world. Jesuit priest and Vatican insider Malachi Martin told us this. Willing or not, ready or not, we are all involved in an all-out, no-holds-barred three-way competition. Most of us are not the competitors, however, we are the stakes. For the competition is about who will establish the first 
one world system of government that has ever existed in the society of nations. The purpose of John Paul's pontificate, the engine that drives his papal grand policies and that determines his day-to-day, year-to-year strategy is to be victor in that competition. The keys of this blood. You notice on the front of that book, on the front cover, it says in a small caption, Pope John Paul II versus Russia and the West for control of the new world order. The day-to-day plans, the year-to-year strategies is for them to be victor in the competition, friends. They're telling us that. They're not just the church. They're not just there for the good of humanity. They want to come back to the position that they were back in the Dark Ages where they were the ruling power of the then known world. And Pope John Paul II, of course, who is now dead, lived his life day to day, planned his life year to year to be victor in the competition. They took down communism. That was one that was gone. Now you just have the West, which is mainly America, and the papacy left. And what is the terminology for this new system? It's called the New World Order. Today there is a world movement taking place to bring in a new world order. Notice what George H. Bush said back in 1991. He said, it's a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspiration of mankind, peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. James Warburg, the Council of Foreign Relations, said this, We shall have world government, whether or not we like it. The question is only whether world government will be achieved by consent or conquest. Even the United Nations is pushing for a world order. There's a few statements here of many that you can find. UN Secretary General Kofi Annan appealed Sunday for Europe and the United States to back a major overhaul of global security. More broadly, he urged the European Union and the United States to work more closely as the backbone of a new world order in the 21st century. Around our world, we are finding today, there is a push from different nations, from different systems, from the United Nations, to gather together for a new world order. What about the papacy itself? What did the Pope say about the new world order? Pope calls for a new world order, Vatican City. Pope John Paul II rang in the new year on Thursday with a renewed call, so this isn't the first time it's happened, for the creation of a new world order based on respect for the dignity of man and the equality among the nations. What about Benedict XVI, the latest Pope, Vatican City? City. Pope Benedict, in his first Christmas address on Sunday, urged humanity to unite against terrorism, poverty and environmental blight and called for a new world order to correct economic imbalances. I believe, my friends, that you and I are right in the last stages of the setting up of this new world order. Notice what the famous financier David Rockefeller had to say. He said this back in 1994. He said, we are on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis, and the nations will accept the new world order. And you know, friends, I believe one of those right major crises, as it were, happened on September 11, 2001, in the United States of America. None of us, friends, will ever forget that day where we were and what we were doing. As we saw on our television screens across the world, those two towers, those twin towers, hit by those aircraft as they came down to the ground, the world was stunned. The world was shocked like a a gigantic earthquake that rippled around the world, the world was shocked as we saw the faces of those people, the terrified look of those who were fleeing from those towers falling down. And on that particular day, I believe the world changed. You know, George Bush said on September 11, he said, today the world has changed forever. Our world will never again be the same. You know, really, friends, that's actually new world order talk. They don't want the world to ever be the same again. There has to be those crises that come into this world that push the inhabitants of the world into a corner where they want to have a new world order. President Bush said Tuesday that there was no room for neutrality in the war against terrorism. He said, you are either with us 
or against us. And today we have Uncle Sam walking around the world, pointing to every nation and people, saying, I want you to do this and that, this and that, and this and that. They are now the police officers of the world, as it were. And today, as never before, we are seeing America speak as a dragon. Revelation 13, verse 11 told us that this power would speak as a dragon. And we've seen this around the world. Even just recently in the war with Iraq, you know, the United Nations and many nations of the world said to America, you shouldn't be going into war with Iraq. We're not going to back you. We want you to stop. And America said what? They said, we don't care what you think. We have decided to go to war with Iraq. We want you to come with us. But if you don't come with us, big deal. We're going to just go by ourselves. It's just telling us that, that, about the power that America has. They are the world power, my friend. Forget the United Nations. If America decides to make a decision, they will do what they want on themselves. And today, friends, America is acting as the world police officer. And the Catholic Church is happy about it. Why? Because it is America that's going to put them back on top. And today, if you talk to people, people are concerned about the United States of America. There was a survey done in the Time magazine back in 2003. They asked 700,000 people the question. This was the question that they asked. Which country poses the greatest danger to world peace in 2003? People responded by saying this. They said 6.7% said North Korea, 6.3% said Iraq, and 86.9% said the United States of America. Today, people are recognizing that the USA is speaking like a dragon. And friends, Bible prophecy is fulfilling 